Good afternoon, my name is Lindy Lee and I'm absolutely delighted and honored to have Dr. Noggle with me today. He's been an uh, amazing leader in the mainline community and we are so grateful that you're willing to spend a few minutes with us. Right now Dr. Noggle serves as the headmaster of the Haverford School, a tremendous institution in um, our community. He was also a lieutenant colonel and a Rhodes Scholar and the author of two books. Mm -hmm. So the list goes on and on. I, um, I was telling him the other day that you, he is one of the most impressive people I know. And so i um, incredibly honored to have him here today and would love to hear more about his story. So what inspired you to serve in the U.S. Army? I was lucky to grow up in a military household. I was born on a Navy base. My dad was first generation college, Naval ROTC. And when although he didn't stay in the Navy long, it was an important influence for him. And so when I was thinking about where I was going to go to school when I was 13 or 14, I asked my dad what he thought I should do. And he was a big fan of the Naval Academy graduates he'd served with while he was in the Navy. And it, so he suggested that I look at the service academies. And growing up in Omaha, Nebraska, um, the, uh, Omaha is actually an Air Force town. Uh, I didn't have much experience of, of either the Army or the Navy, and I was very lucky that my dad uh, took me on a, and my grandma, his mom, uh, on a trip to the East Coast. We drove from Omaha, and we visited West Point, and I fell in love with the place. The, the, the granite, the, the, the statues of uh, Patton and Eisenhower and MacArthur, and, and the, the sense of purpose about the place really um, dug deep into me, and, and honestly, they've never let go. And, and so I knew immediately that that was where I wanted to be. And um, the, the experience at West Point went very, very well for me. It was a very good choice for me. I, I thrived on the discipline and on that shared sense of purpose that animated all of the people I came to know, the, the fellow students, the cadets, uh, the professors, the faculty, both both civilian and military, and I found role models who continue to be important influences on me even today. That's fantastic, and you ended up as a Rhodes Scholar. Can you tell us more about your journey in England? One of the neatest opportunities you have as an undergraduate is to compete for the Rhodes Scholarship, which is awarded to people with good academic records, uh, people who've shown some good character, some leadership potential, and had some success for and fondness in sports. Uh, and and the, the motivating idea behind the Rhodes Scholarship is that they are looking for people to fight the world's fight. And uh, one of my West Point classmates and I were, were the two West Pointers chosen in my year for two years of study at Oxford. And so after I graduated from West Point, I went to tank school, the Army's tank school, in Fort Knox, Kentucky, where they keep the gold and the tanks, and uh, then went from there on to Oxford University for two just magical years studying international politics. The, the, the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed while I was studying international politics at Oxford. So in 1989, uh, so we called off classes and we went oh, to Berlin wow. and we got a piece of the rock. Uh, and and, and so, so it was real. International politics was very real. And as a, as a West Point cadet, I had patrolled the border between the two Germanys. I, I led, uh, at, at 19 or 20 years old, I, I led a, a, a patrol of 15 soldiers carrying live rounds in our weapons uh, for the first time. And it was real. The, the Soviets sent up a, a hind helicopter to, to shadow our patrol. And, and mistakes, the possibility of mistakes seemed like it could have literally life-ending consequences, international consequences. And, and so to, to have seen that in 1986, and then just three years later, to, to, to literally be taking the Berlin Wall apart with my own hands was uh, an extraordinary experience. And, and, and I, I already loved the concept of international politics, but now I was living it. And, and so, um, it was a, a great time to be studying that subject. It was perhaps, it appeared, a less good time to be an armor officer. So the, mm -hmm. the United States Army at that time had 250,000 soldiers in Europe. I'd studied German at West Point because I thought I was gonna be patrolling the border between East and West, and then all of a sudden, the Russians quit. 
And, and so it wasn't quite clear what I was going to do for a career when, um, when I left Oxford in the summer of 1990. But then Saddam Hussein happened. And, and all of a sudden, my, my career prospects were looking good again. That's incredible. You've been on an amazing trajectory. So tell us more about how you managed to rise to the ranks of the Army. <laughs> so so I, I graduated from West Point as a second lieutenant, was promoted to first lieutenant after um, two years of hard duty at Oxford. Um, so I, how old were you at I, this point? So I was 25. I was 24, I think. I was 20. 24 when, um, when I left Oxford in the summer of 1990 and Saddam Hussein had invaded Iraq and I was assigned to the 1st Cavalry Division out of Fort Hood, Texas and um, went over to, uh, to Saudi Arabia initially for Operation Desert Shield and then as the, the buildup of forces continued went to, um, uh, the, it, it, it turned to Operation Desert Storm in February of 1991 and uh, by this point, I was a tank platoon leader in charge of four tanks, 15 guys plus me, and and it was a, a, a great, a great first war. The the first cavalry division moved farther faster than any military unit had in the history of warfare, uh, at uh, to that point in time, and and we took the Iraqi army from the fourth largest in the world to the second largest in Iraq in a period of 100 hours. And the war ended literally on my 25th birthday, oh, wow. February 28th, 1991. And it was a wonderful thing to be 25 years old and alive and unharmed and all of my soldiers to be unharmed and my first war to be over. That's incredible. Wow. So what inspires you to lead the Haverford School? Well, so, so there, there are many intervening steps yeah. uh, Feel free to uh, talk uh, about along, them, by along the way. The way. So, so after Desert Storm, the Army sent me back to Oxford to get my PhD. And, and while there, I studied not the kind of war I just fought, war of, of tank on tank, uh, but, but uh, a more ancient kind of warfare, war of uh, insurgency and terrorism and, and guerrillas. And, and, and so I, I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation, which uh, after the attacks of September 11th became a book on, on counterinsurgency. Uh, and, and worked on that book while I was teaching at West Point. I I'd, um, loved my time at West Point, as I said, and I, I really wanted to, to give back. And, and these, these young, dashing captains of, of armor and cavalry had been my role models, and now I was that dashing young captain. And so I, I taught a bunch of kids and uh, great young men and women and helped a bunch of them compete for Rhodes Scholarships and Marshall Scholarships and sent a bunch of them to England. And, um, and, and then the attacks of September 11th happened, and all of a sudden, the, the book that I'd written, the, the doctoral dissertation I'd written on counterinsurgency strategy was a matter of great interest to the country and the world, and, and so I was able to get it published then, and then having written a book on counterinsurgency, uh, I, 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 I did it backwards. I, I wrote the book, and then I did the research. I was sent to Iraq to actually practice counterinsurgency in 2003. In, and served in Al Anbar province in, in the toughest the, the toughest thing I've, I've ever done, what I, I sincerely hope is the hardest thing I ever will do, so conducted counterinsurgency in, in Al Anbar, Iraq. When the, the Sunni insurgency there was, was really catching fire, when Al Qaeda was making its inroads into Iraq and we fought against Al Qaeda in Iraq soldiers and, and um, over the course of a, a year I was in combat for a full year didn't didn't go home. Um, we lost 22 soldiers. We had more than 150 wounded. We um, earned a valorous unit award. And, and at the end of our year fighting my first counterinsurgency campaign, we were no closer to building a competent Iraqi government that had the support of the people. We'd made some progress on building Iraqi police forces and Iraqi army to, to try to hold on to uh, their own country, but but um, it was enormously disheartening year, and, and we got back from that year at war, and and made up coffee cups that said Iraq 2004. We were winning when I left, because we knew we weren't, and and I went from there to the Pentagon, and and worked for Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, and and while there, helped 
Paul and, and the Pentagon think about the war that I just come from, the, the, where, where I'd been on the front lines, and became reacquainted with General David Petraeus, who'd been one of those young captains at, at West Point, who, who also uh, earned his doctorate yeah. at Princeton um, and, and loves Princeton. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Petraeus, by now a, a three-star general, was appointed to lead the Army's uh, command, uh, Combined Arms Center at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, responsible for writing Army doctrine. And, and so I, I gained contact with him and suggested that the Army needed to rewrite its counterinsurgency doctrine and helped Petraeus with that project. And, and so published the Army's first new counterinsurgency doctrine in two decades. And, and was then um, privileged to help Petraeus implement that. I was, I was commanding a unit in, in Kansas by now that was providing advisor teams to embed inside Iraqi army uh, units and Afghan army units as, as that war continued. And, and so helped Petraeus, um, pro provide Petraeus some of the tools he needed to succeed uh, to the extent that, that we were able to do so in, in both of those wars. And 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 um, ultimately retired from the army after 20 years as a as a lieutenant colonel, and continued to stay in the foreign policy world. So I I taught at West Point. I now uh, became an adjunct professor at Georgetown, um, and and taught counterinsurgency strategy there a little bit, and became president of the Center for a New American Security in Washington, a, a defense policy think tank that that helped the government think about. Uh, in particular, the demands of, of war in Iraq and in Afghanistan. I do want to say one thing, though. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can overestimate the importance of what you propose that the U.S. government do. Counterinsurgency was co completely novel. You know, they still thought it was army against army when it was really army against guerrilla warfare. So can you talk about more about the ramifications of that? So, so um, in the wake of the Vietnam War, uh, which, which had not gone well, um, for the U.S. military, big historical debate over over uh, how effectively the Army learned counterinsurgency in that war, and I am I am of the belief that that by the end of it we were actually getting pretty good at it, um, but it didn't matter. We'd lost the political will to continue that fight, and then after the Vietnam War, the Army consciously turned away from counterinsurgency, decided that those weren't the kind of wars we were going to fight anymore, and and having fought in both conventional war and counterinsurgency. I, I have some sympathy for the Army's position. It's a whole lot more fun charging across the desert in a tank than it is fighting the grinding war of landmines and improvised explosive de devices and snipers that I fought in, in Iraq in 2003 and 2004. But you don't always get to pick which strategy your enemy is going to use, and so I believed that we needed to be prepared for all kinds of war. And when the, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars broke out, the attacks of September 11th, we were unprepared as Secretary of Defense, Defense Gates said, for those wars that we were actually fighting. And we had to relearn lessons that we'd previously bought and paid for with the blood of our sons and daughters. And I was, was um, proud and honored to be a part of, of relearning those lessons while deeply saddened that it was necessary to relearn them at all. But, but, but so was, was a, a part of that project uh, that, that created the Army Marine Corps. The Army and Marines worked together on the project of the Army Marine Corps Counterinsurgency Field Manual in December of 2006. It was published by the University of Chicago Press on, Gen on uh, July 4th, 2007. Uh, it, it was uh, downloaded a million and a half times, wow. uh, right? The, the month after we, we uh, printed it, it was translated and critiqued on jihadi websites. Copies were found in Taliban training camps in Pakistan. So we knew our enemies were reading it, but we had to get our guys to read the book and, and to understand the basic principles of counterinsurgency, in particular, understanding that, that the key to defeating the enemy in this kind of war is protecting the people from the enemy. And so you have to live among the people. You have to eat the food that the people eat. You need to share their risks in, in order to succeed in this kind of war. And so that was the, the book we published in, in December 2006. It was the strategy Petraeus implemented when he went to Iraq in 2007. It was a strategy he later tried to implement in Afghanistan when he was sent there a couple of years later. Uh, truly, I think, a revolution in, in how the American military thought about its business, the, the business of protecting the American people. 
by protecting our friends and allies in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. You mentioned that our enemies were reading the manual that you wrote. Do you know why? So I get asked that question a lot. It, it seems counterintuitive to let the enemy know what your plan is. However, we, we, were, we were playing catch up ball. We hadn't had a counterinsurgency manual in, in more than two decades. We'd never trained on it. And so our own team didn't know what, what plays we were playing. And, and so as a, uh, as a uh, former not very good football player, uh, I, I know that it's unfortunate when the other side knows your signals and, and knows what's coming. But it's even more unfortunate if your own team doesn't know what, what, what they're doing. And that was the case we, we found ourselves in. And a, a whole bunch of the people who we needed to understand counterinsurgency aren't in the military and don't have security clearances. So our, arguably, the role of the Agency for International Development or uh, the State Department is just as important as the role of the military in a counterinsurgency campaign. And so we, we made the conscious decision to publish the manual and unclassified, to hang it on the internet, and, and um, tried to get everybody on our team, at least, to know what our play was. The, the, what the enemy learned from, from reading the manual is that our strategy was changing from find and destroy the enemy, which had been the purpose of, of the U.S. military for, for two centuries at that point, to find and protect the population from the enemy. Once the enemy is safe, once the population is safe, the enemy won't be able to do you any real damage, and the population will be able to tell you who the enemy is. And, and so um, while, while they then knew, while the Taliban, while al-Qaeda, all the Sunni insurgents then knew what our strategy was. It's a very effective strategy. It's a hard strategy to defeat. Insurgents do best when they provoke an overreaction from, from the West, from, from our side. And that's what they were able to do for the first several years of both the Iraq and the Afghan wars. Once we tapered back on the violence and focused on protecting the population, it became much harder for them to do uh, what it was they wanted to do, which is really drive a wedge between us and the local population. And, and we were fortunate uh, that, that in Iraq, just as we were adopting this new strategy, we, we started to make some inroads. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq responded by, by actually adopting uh, a strategy much, much more like the one that we had previously advocated, one of, of much more violence against their own people. And, and that pushed the people who are the real prize in a counterinsurgency campaign away from Al-Qaeda and the Sunni insurgents and, and toward the West and us. And, and so we were able to reduce violence by an extraordinary amount during Petraeus's 18 months in, in command in Iraq over the course of 2007 and 2008, in no small part because our strategy was unclassified and available to everybody. Absolutely. I just wanted our audience to know how truly transformative what you wrote was for our country. So thank you for that. Yeah, and grateful. also thank you for your service, obviously. A, and, a, a privilege. Uh, a privilege to serve. I wish I could do it all over again. And now you are serving our community here on the main line. Can you tell us more about what led you to the Howard yeah. School? Yeah. Um, um, so um, having retired from the Army and, and worked in a think tank uh, for several years again on on. Uh, military and, and national security policy, I received an offer to become a history chair at the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, uh, my second favorite service academy. And as, a, uh, as the son of a naval officer, I, uh, and, and as a man who turned down a Naval Academy appointment to, to go to West Point, I actually had both of them in oh, my wow. office at the Naval Academy. And I, I, I pointed out to the kids, the, the midshipmen of the Naval Academy, that, that actions have consequences and you can choose the harder right like going to West Point or the easier wrong, like going to the Naval Academy. And, and that choice will have lifelong consequences. Um, but but um, so just, just a, a wonderful opportunity to teach some of uh, America's finest sons and daughters and also to write uh, my most recent book, uh, Knife Fights, A Memoir of Modern War, which really tells much of the story mm -hmm. we've been having today uh, about coming to terms with the idea of counterinsurgency, learning about it, and then helping popularize the idea in the American military, in the French military, in, in uh, Western militaries around the globe, in our State Department, uh, and, and, and 
trying to popularize that idea in order to help the nation be more effective fighting and winning the wars we're fighting now and hopefully preventing wars of the future by being capable across the entire spectrum of conflict. So, so that was the, the, the work I did uh, at the Naval Academy. While I was there, uh, I, I received a call from a friend who thought that I might be a good candidate to be a college president. And um, I, I was married at the time, and, and the um, interviews were going well, the process was going well, and I took my, my um, then wife and, and our son uh, up to take a look at the college. And the, the community was not where she wanted to be, and the schools were not what we wanted for our son. Uh, and so I, I pulled out of that search and um, told my friend I was, was leaving the search. And she asked why, and I said, I need a place that has some more culture for my wife and a better school for my son. And she said, well, John, I, I wouldn't have thought of you for this, but I've got a top five boys school looking for a headmaster on Philadelphia's main line. That'd be, that's a community with enormous culture uh, for your family and a great school for your son. How do you feel about being a headmaster instead of a college president? And I said, I don't know, what's a headmaster? <sighs> and now five years in, I'm starting to figure that out. As near as I can tell, being a headmaster is way more fun than being a college president. Um, it's been a joy, literally a joy every day. I actually, well, obviously, because my brother went to the Harvard School, I spent a lot of time with your students, and they almost, I mean, universally respect and adore you. So you have transformed these, the lives of these young men in amazing ways. So thank you so much for your hard work. And um, what lessons on the battlefield inform your decision making today as a headmaster? So um, uh, coincidentally, we had a, a panel today, uh, a military panel of uh, four former military officers, including Marissa Porges, uh, head of the Baldwin School, a uh, good friend. Uh, who, uh, Marissa and I worked together in the Pentagon on counterterrorism uh, low these many years ago, uh, and, and she's now been the head of the Baldwin School for two years. But we, we had a military panel in front of our seventh grade boys talking about military leadership and lessons mm -hmm. of military leadership for um, for for life, and and um, there were there were many. The biggest thing I think that that uh, both Marissa and I talked about today is that the military is a team of teams. You can get very little done as an individual, but but for uh, me as a tank commander, as part of a, a a broader tank company, and then tank battalion as part of a combined arms task force that had uh, air support overhead. Um, we, we, you operate as part of an uh, air ground team. Marissa flying uh, airplanes off of carrier decks. She's got to have a, a, a support team to get her up, up uh, into the air and back down. And, and, and she was a, an electronic warfare officer providing electronic um, safety net, uh, essentially a protective bubble cocoon for, for all of the airplanes up in the air. You, you succeed only to the extent that you're able to work as part of a team. You have to know your strengths and your weaknesses, the capabilities of your systems and those of your friends, and, and then understand what it is that your enemy is trying to accomplish as well. And so uh, I, I hope what we're able to talk to the boys about today is the need to be good teammates, to earn the respect of those around you, and, and the trust and the confidence of everyone around you so that they all want to be on your team, they want you to be on their team, and and they absolutely know that when the chips are down, you've got your back, you've got their back, and you'll be there for them. And and so that was one of the one of the really big lessons I think that does apply when moving from the military world to the civilian world. As we prepare boys to be members of teams, members of communities who are going to make a difference themselves in whatever their chosen field of endeavor is. They need to be good teammates who everyone knows are responsible members who can be trusted. Absolutely. So in that spirit, what is the most important advice that you have ever received? So I was, um, um, I, I mentioned earlier um, the mentors and the role models I saw um, at West Point as a, as a cadet, um, young officers and mid-grade officers. One of them was uh, Dan Kaufman. Um, who remains my son's godfather, a wonderful man, retired as, as dean of the, the faculty at West Point. And, and Dan uh, was in a lieutenant colonel, and after my first semester at West Point, he invited me in. 
uh, and to, to his office. I was just back from Christmas break. And, and he sat me down and he said, John, I've seen your grades. I said, yes, sir, because he was a colonel. So I said, yes, sir. He said, they're good. I said, thank you, sir. He said, they're real good. I said, thank you, sir. He said, okay, listen, this is what you're going to do. You're going to major in international relations, compete for a Rhodes Scholarship, become an armor officer, fight in a war, get an advanced degree, and then come back, probably from Oxford, and then come back here and teach for me in the political science department at West Point. What are your questions? I said, sir, I have no questions. He said, good, execute. 10 wow. years later, 10 years later, all of those things had happened. I was sitting on his porch uh, overlooking the Hudson River. He asked me if I remembered that conversation. I said, sir, how could I forget it? He said, uh, John, I'm finally going to get to rate you on, on the official ranking form for an Army officer. And, and, and I'm going to write, I know exactly what I'm going to write. It's only three words. OK. I, you know, I, I can tell a punchline is coming. Bring it. He said, officer follows instructions. And so the best advice I've ever gotten is follow instructions, wow. right? Find good mentors. Find people who have, have done things that make a difference and learn everything you possibly can from them. Right? Seek out mentors, people who have made a difference, and make them yours. And maintain those relationships. Because 30, 40 years later, right, if you've chosen wisely, those will still be people who've made a huge difference in your life. And, and you'll be able then to, to, in turn, become mentors to the next generation. So I, I, I strongly believe in playing it forward. In, in the responsibility to, to, to plant acorns that will become oak trees that, that we, we, will never, we will never enjoy the shade of, of the oak trees uh, whose seeds we plant. But it is nonetheless, because we enjoy the shade of oak trees, it is our responsibility to do that for the next generation. And so that's, that's a, a big part of how I think about uh, my role at the Haverford School and our role in building great boys and, and helping those boys become men who are prepared for lives that make a difference in Philadelphia, America, and the world. Wow, so I was impressed with you before and now I'm just uh, completely floored by all that you've accomplished. I, so you're still incredibly young. Where do you see yourself in a decade or so? Do so you I'm, have I'm, a long-term plan? I'm, you're kind, I'm 52. Um, I'd, I'd um, always thought that there were going to be three chunks of my life if I got to live long enough that I was going to have an army section and a Washington section and then be uh, a college president or a named chair somewhere. Uh, and, and in fact, all of those things have happened. And, and uh, I'm, I'm 52, I've still got some time left with, with inshallah. Um, and, and, and so um, I am enjoying being the Haverford School's ninth headmaster more than I ever could have imagined. I, I thought I would enjoy it or I wouldn't have taken the job, but it is a daily joy. It is a, a challenge. I never do the same thing two days in a row. What a gorgeous and campus, it's a right? It's a beautiful campus. We're gonna make it uh, even better, um, we, we hope. And, and um, the, the, boys, the boys stay young. The boys stay the same age, even as we age. And, and, and so uh, you stay young uh, because the, the students stay young. And, and so if, if I'm in my fifth year now, if I could do it for another 10 years, 15 years, I'd be delighted. Uh, at some point, um, I will, will probably uh, have to slow down. And, and then for my final act, I'd love to teach sort of one class a semester at, at Haverford College or Princeton. Swarthmore or Princeton. Um, and I, 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 one of the fun things I get to do now, uh, I've, I've been at it long enough that, that my, my students, my former students, are, are in classes at, at, at great schools, and a bunch of them are reading my stuff. Right? They're reading some of my books. And, and so I go visit, uh, I, I lecture at Penn every year. Um, uh, a friend of mine teaches a military strategy course. I, I Skyped into a class at Yale uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and, and uh, lectured there for, for one of my former students. And, and so um, ultimately, I will, uh, I think, after um, when the school decides that I've outlived my usefulness as, as an administrator and a manager and a, a headmaster, uh, I hope I, I still have enough gas left in the tank to, to be a professor, you know, sort of one last go and, and teach it at some place like Princeton would be awesome. Yeah. That'd be neat. I just want to say one last thing. I first encountered your name not through my brother, but through my class. 
at Princeton mm -hmm. and had no idea that I you would end up as the headmaster of my brother so this is just incredible your your reach is universal it's very wide okay. I hope you know you. that and so thank you so much again for coming today we're incredibly honored to have you and um, we all learned a lot and thank you for your service freedom is not free it's because of people like you that we are able to enjoy the liberties that we have today I'm, I'm very mindful this this uh, just a couple of days after Memorial Day um, uh, of those who, who did not get to come back and, and so I'm grateful to them and I'm grateful to you for this great conversation thank, thank you. you so much Dr. Thank you, Lenny. thank you thank you so much for joining us today I deeply appreciate your time and hope you'll join us next time for listening with Lindy Lee you are watching Radnor Studio 21, 